lives uh, in itself. And so as we look um, through the last couple of weeks, three weeks ago we took a look at the value of human life and that every person and every culture and every color of people is not just important to God, but is a reflection of who he is. And ultimately then it's a blessing for us to be able to see the tapestry of colors and the tapestry of, um, of different cultures and the way that they worship uh, Jesus uh, woven into our fabric of the world so we can embrace that as a gift that is from God. And then two weeks ago, we talked about the dangers of alcohol and addiction, and we explored how alcohol and drugs may look like a solution that the world has to offer, that initially it seems to offer some relief from the pain that we're feeling, but ultimately what happens, it ends up exacerbating the problems that we have in our lives and that the only solution that we have uh, for the problems that plague us in this world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then last week we talked about mental health and suicide. We took uh, three common questions and we walked through them. Uh, very common question number one was, where is God in my depression? Where is God in my depression? Because that seems to be the first thing to go. That it seems like that which can help us the most is the first thing that, that seems to become uh, hopeless for us. And we looked at some different uh, stories about to God and about um, how he uh, can uh, influence our lives and how he loves us in a way that allows us to battle depression. And then the, the third question that we looked at and one that was close to my heart and is close to my heart is, is my loved one who committed suicide in heaven? And the answer is ultimately yes. As long as they accepted Jesus Christ, they are forgiven and it doesn't matter how their lives ended. And while these topics and other taboo topics may uh, make churches and people uncomfortable, uh, we believe that the, that the Lord has a message for each and every one of us that allows us to be able to face not only these questions, but other questions. And that the Bible is, uh, is part of uh, who, uh, who God wants us to become, and that as we are able to plunge into that, we are able to see how God wants us to live in different areas of our lives. And that's why today, in the culture that's um, driven by an over-sexualization of culture, um, we are going to talk about our final taboo topic, which will be sex. And I've entitled this message, Body Worship, uh, specifically because um, sex can become something that we worship. Sex can become a worship uh, that, is, that is misunderstood and a worship that can cause us to bow down to it. And so I want you to um, kind of put away the, the idea that um, you know, sex is a taboo topic because ultimately God created it for something more than what the world says it is. So either we bow down to the whims of our bodies and worship at the temple of other people's bodies, or we bow down to God and we have a decision to make about how we live each of our lives. And so today, I'd like you to keep three questions in mind. And those three questions are, to whom does my body ultimately belong? To whom does my body ultimately belong? The second question is, what does it mean to be one with Christ? What does it mean to be one with Christ? And then third, knowing what it costs Jesus to redeem us, do I need to change the way that I am living? Knowing what it costs Jesus do I need to change the way that I'm living? And I want to um, invite you to open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. Uh, the passage will also be on the screen for you if you need it. And as you're getting there, I'll just give you a little bit of background about what's going on in the church of Corinth. Uh, they, this church is extraordinarily sick. They um, are in like the center of a culture that is, has been pagan for centuries where they have uh, sacrifices, where they uh, believe that prostitution helps you uh, become more spiritual. They've been polluted by the ways of the world. They've forgotten that they have been bought with a price and that ultimately um, Jesus expects something greater than what they're experiencing. That Jesus wants them to have something more than what the world has to offer. In fact, the world is so, this church is so sick that they have adopted into their family or uh, adopted as a Christian brother 
uh, a person who has taken his own father's wife, his stepmother, as his own wife. And something that the Romans didn't even approve of. And Paul's uh, here in Corinthians saying, what in the world are you doing? What in the world are you doing? The pagans don't even accept this. And yet here you are claiming to be Christians and living in this way and accepting somebody like this. So as uh, 1 Corinthians moves on, Paul continues to admonish the church and in a didactic uh, fashion or an instructional fashion, um, he moves through each chapter giving us uh, ways that we can learn to be more like Christ. And so chapter 6, verses 12 through 20 is no different. And he takes several justifications for sexual immorality and argues against them. And at this point, the church is uh, continuing to accept uh, the, the um, pagan uh, view of sex and saying that it's a way to become uh, more spiritual. And so these Christians are going to pagan temples and sleeping with the prostitutes that are sitting outside these temples. So here we go, um, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. All things, are lawful, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and stomach for food. And the Lord will destroy them both, and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also be, raise us up in his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ and make them uh, members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who has joined the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body, but sexual immorality, uh, uh, sexual, sexually immoral persons sin against their own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that as we move through this text today, that we will see and that we will realize that ultimately um, our lives are part of who, um, of, of you. As Christians, we are part of you. And that we have uh, a way that we are to live that is glorifying to you. And that uh, while the world may say uh, these things uh, are good, you're saying, yes, you're lawfully allowed to do these things. But listen, it's not always good. And in fact, it's sinful. And as we as Christians have come to Jesus and said, uh, Lord, forgive us of our sins, that we should have a desire in our hearts to avoid the things that hurt you. And so I pray that you'll open our eyes and our ears today and help us to receive the message that you have. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. The first point I want to make is that uh, we need to have a right view of the body. We need to have a right view of our bodies. Paul begins the passage by countering some popular arguments for sexual immorality. He says, um, you know, you shouldn't be having sex with a prostitute uh, even though you're saying all things are lawful. And I'm telling you, yes, that might be true, but not all things are helpful. So Paul here acknowledges the reality that the saying all things are lawful is true. That because of who we are in Christ, but that because of our salvation in Christ, we are no longer under the law and under the punishment of the law. But when we become uh, believers in Christ, we should desire more than simply following rules. Ultimately, we should be loving God in such a way that causes us to want to love him. Yes, we shouldn't take advantage of of those things that God says, yes, you're no longer under the curse, but why would you do that to someone who has given so much for you? Not all things are helpful. So immediately we see the strange rationalization of the Corinthians that are trying to rationalize their sinful behavior. And to be clear, these Christian pagans, again, are going to pagan temples where there are religious prostitutes that the Romans and the pagans believed helped them get to a higher spiritual plane. And so Paul's looking at them and he's saying, 
you're having sex with prostitutes, but you're not even realizing that it's not helping you at all. It's not helping you become more like Christ. It's not helping you reach a higher spiritual plane when all you need is Jesus. It's a literal pouring after an idol. That you are going to a place that is demonic, that where they have built this statue that they worship, and you're sleeping with that prostitute. So not only are you bowing down to an idol and saying, yeah, we think that you know Jesus is enough, but now we think we might need some extra stuff. You're saying to, your, uh, to us, well, you know, I think I still need more. And I'm going to bow down at this prostitute's feet and worship her instead. Paul tells him, hey, listen, nothing could be further from the truth. It's not helpful. In fact, it's harmful to your relationship with God. So yes, sure, all things are lawful for you. But listen, I will not be dominated by anything. I will not be dominated by anything. Because we can be a slave of one of two things, righteousness or unrighteousness. If we're bowing down uh, our lives and our bodies at somebody else and, and at, the, at sex then we're not bowing down at the altar of Jesus. We're filling it with something that it wasn't meant to be. And many people pursue sex like this. It's like some kind of force that pushes them forward to the next sexual conquest. And so you become dominated by an interest of just finding the next sexual partner in hopes that that will make us feel complete. And, Je and Paul's already saying, listen, you're already complete in Jesus Christ. And you shouldn't be dominated by anything else. Because when we're following the law of sex, we're not really free. And in fact, it makes us feel worse about who God says we are. God says you're a child, and yet you're saying I'm worthless when you're laying down with an idol. The next argument goes like this. Um, verse 13 says, Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the food. And then Paul says, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Basically, what the Corinthians are saying, hey, if you got an itch, scratch it. If you got an itch, scratch it. Sex becomes more than, uh, less than what God intended it to be. It becomes simply a hunger to the Corinthians to be satisfied and nothing more. But see, it, it totally misses the point of why God gave us the gift of sex. Paul says, God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but the Lord for the body and the body for the Lord. So I can't tell you how many times I've seen girls and, and guys be used by somebody who's simply ser searching to scratch an itch, put another notch in their belt. They'll say all the right things. They'll schmooze you. They'll make everything seem great. And then the next morning you wake up and you feel completely worthless because they just walked out the door. And they'll never call you again. Does that sound familiar? There's a story uh, from DailyMail.com. I just pulled some clips out of this. Um, it says, he was incredibly good looking and all the girls fancied him, recalls Ainsley who uh, had now taken a vow of celibacy after a string of soulless one-night stands left her feeling cheap and worthless. He pursued me relentlessly, and I felt flattered that he was attracted to me. But after I slept with him, I never heard from him again. And later I discovered he had many girls on the go. And for a while I loved being single, and I went crazy sleeping with lots of different men. But I quickly realized it was a bit of a, an emotional roller coaster. One guy who was meant to be a close friend, took advantage of me when I was really drunk. We ended up having sex, and the next morning I woke up, and I was mortified. And in an online poll uh, regarding one-night stands, the chief emotion expressed by women after a one-night stand is regret. Regret. Paul says, ultimately, God will destroy both the hunger and the food. That sex was created for a greater purpose, purpose than simply gratifying our, uh, gratif simply for a gratifying experience. Ultimately, the body was created to glorify God, and God is the one who blesses our body. 
So seeking after sexual pleasures may seem nice. It's not the ultimate purpose for which we were created. Ultimately, we were perfect for, uh, for loving God, worshiping Him, glorifying Him, and living uh, in a way that not only uh, lets us love God, but lets us love other people. So God had a greater purpose. The next point I want to bring to your attention is that we need to have a right view of the union. A right view of the union. Paul says this, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take a member of Christ and make it a uh, member of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. The reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that when we receive Jesus in faith, that we are immediately filled with his spirit. And that as we are filled with his spirit, the promises that he has given to us are realized immediately. That we are saved. That these things are currently happening. That the world is already redeemed when Jesus promises that when we reach the end, he will conquer all. And therefore, we are one with him because he's living inside of us. We are one with with Jesus, which means that when we take someone who is not our husband or wife into bed, we are now taking Jesus with us. Now, I don't want it to sound weird. Jesus is not like uh, engaging in this, but we are taking him with us. We are hurting his spirit and really trampling the blood of Jesus Christ by saying, I'm going to do what I want. It's like uh, taking a best friend that you may have and sleeping with their girlfriend. Why would you do that? It hurts people. And we hurt Jesus as we move into those kind of relationships. We grieve the spirit. And to make matters worse, the Corinthians don't even have this right view of sex. They see it as an appetite. They were concerned with the fact that they were representing Jesus and claiming to be different than the world while they were sleeping with prostitutes. They were seeking to relieve an intense desire of sexual gratification outside of the normal realm of marriage. You see, God had a plan when he created sex. He didn't want us to have multiple sexual partners. He desired for us to have one. The one. Now why would he desire for us to have one? He says, Paul says this. Do you not realize that when you have sex with her, you're becoming one body with her? But listen, in this case, somehow... One plus one equals one. But if we start adding other people into that equation, guess what? One plus one begins to equal two, three, four, six, seven. And before we realize it, we have an issue. We have an issue. We can't become intimate with the one that God appointed for us to be intimate with. You see, we can't be one with somebody when we've been one with others. Because one plus one should always equal one. So regardless of who it is, whether you're a girlfriend or an ex-wife, a boyfriend, a prostitute, or whatever, there's a oneness that occurs with that person that really can't be explained. We are inexplicably interconnected with that person for the rest of our lives. So years down the road, we may find ourselves thinking about that person from years ago. Somebody that we used to know. But see, God's desire for us was to have one husband or one wife. And that sex was a gift 
inside the confines of marriage to help build the bond of intimacy that we could have a oneness with another person that was unshakable and unbreakable. See, there's a oneness in Christ and a oneness in, uh, in, uh, with us, and there's a oneness in the Godhead that's unbreakable. And marriage is a reflection of that, that there's a oneness. And as Christians, we must realize also that the union that exists between us and Christ is more important than anything. And that's a grieve Christ is one of the worst things that we can do. So I want to move on to our point number three. We need to have a right view of the cost. A right view of the cost. So flip back with me over to um, verses 18 through 20, which read this way. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that the temple, uh, that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. Every other sin is outside of the body. So there are three things in these last couple of verses that Paul um, brings us to. First of all, every other sin is outside the body, but what you do with your body Sexually, in a sexually immoral way is against your own body. It doesn't benefit your body. In fact, it causes problems further down the road. The second one is, our bodies are a temple for the Holy Spirit. And we think about the temple that used to, um, used to be in Israel, and that that temple was a place that was holy and was a place where the people um, could walk into. But there was this holy of holies where God reigned and where God lived and where God stayed. And it's where uh, the high priest would go in once a year and offer sacrifices. And he better darn well be clean before God because guess what? If he's not, he's going to be struck dead. And then we think that Jesus and the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit is now living in us. That we are a temple for the Lord, that we should keep our temples holy and righteous. And our new identity in Christ frees us and protects us from the stain of sin. So why would we want to bring that stain back upon us when we've received the gospel of Jesus and committed to following him and to loving him? Living out our lives for God's glory and God's pleasure is what we were created to do. Which brings us to the third point that Paul makes. We were bought with a price. Flee sexual immorality because we were bought for a price. You see, Jesus wasn't just hanging on the cross. Facing the, the eternal wrath of God being poured out upon him. So that we could just do whatever we want. Paul says, think about the cost. Think about what it cost Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Think about the freedom that he has now given you. Maybe we must realize for uh, whom our body was made for. For whom our body was made. And how connected we are to the one who sacrificed so much for each and every one of us. One of the greatest things about the gospel of Jesus is that the promises of Jesus are already realized when we receive him in faith. The promises of Jesus are already realized when we receive him in faith. When the gospel is the center of our lives, when Christ is the center of our lives, everything else is able to revolve around that, and we are able to look at things and to say, is this something that me, who is now one with Christ, would be wise to do? You see, Jesus already calls us his children. We may think that sexual immorality will bring us hope, but guess what? It makes you feel worthless at the end. There is only one thing in this world that will fulfill our promises, or fulfill our lives, and those are the promises of Jesus Christ, who fills our lives where we never walk away feeling worthless because the very creator of this world says, you are my child. You are my child. 
And that's what happens when we come to Jesus Christ. And he invites us each and every day to look at our lives and to examine the changes that we may need to make to know and love him more. And I want to give you a few moments just to do that and to examine your own hearts today, to take a look at the areas where you think uh, that, that there may need to be a correction, that God, is, uh, that God is waiting with open arms to forgive us. We're already forgiven, but we don't want to grieve the Spirit.